Welcome to ESC TV Conversations at ESC Congress 2022 in Barcelona. My name is Carlos Aguiar, I'm a cardiologist based in Portugal and I'm delighted to have with us Professor Milton Pecker, a world-renowned distinguished cardiology and expert in the field of heart failure, responsible for more than 15 trials in large randomized trials that have been changing the practice of medicine, such as the more recent one, Paradigm Heart Failure. And Dr. Pecker, five years ago, was asked at this particular Congress to reflect on what heart failure treatment would look like in 10 years' time. And then you put this out in writing as well and published it in the European Heart Journal some months later. And I remember you saying and writing down that you were afraid of what people would be thinking about if uh, some years later they would read this paper and actually sort of, you know, put you on trial with your predictions. And there were five predictions there, and it's, I think we're halfway th uh, through the 10 years, so it's an excellent time to start thinking about them and where we are at the moment and what amendments or not might be necessary. So let's start with prediction number one, which was regarding the way we would be treating heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So, Carl, it, it, it was just a wonderful opportunity. 2017, and uh, ESC said, makes five predictions that will come true in the next 10 years. And I said, I do not have a crystal ball. I, or I, I used to have one, but I lost it. And the, uh, they said, well, do your best. And, and we will not hold you to it. So I, I made five predictions. First prediction was that uh, what we called heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, which is an ejection fraction of uh, greater than 40%, would be divided into two phenotypes. Uh, one uh, at the lower end, which would be an inflammatory phenotype, and uh, the one at the upper end, which would be a stiffness uh, phenotype, a uh, very small ventricle uh, with uh, enormous amount of um, uh, aortic loading. And uh, we would treat these two phenotypes differently. We would treat the inflammatory phenotype as if it was a neurohormonal disorder, and we would treat the uh, stiffness phenotype, well, I didn't have any clue how well, we would Possibly with agents that would be able to reverse or, ventricular dissent. Or has, have some people have rec uh, suggested even pericard uh, per pericardiotomy that might sort of help the uh, ventricle to dilate. And um, so th this prediction was made and uh, it, it is uh, extraordinary over the last couple years, we actually have shown that neurohormonal antagonists, including SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, are effective up to about 60, 65%. And uh, over, uh, over 60, 65%, they seem to have an attenuated effect. And there's this wonderful, wonderful study from Leipzig that just came out in circulation six weeks ago that show that if you divide patients with HEFPEF less than 65, greater than 65, the ones less than 65 have an inflammatory disorder with fibrosis, and the ones greater than 65 have a shift in the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. So it was, it was just a dream come true. I read the paper five times. I couldn't believe that they had, one, uh, actually done such an incredibly quality study and that it all made sense. So um, that was prediction number one. And prediction number two was about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and that we would be changing the way we treat it to predominantly act on autophagy. Right. Speak to us about what this autophagy is so, about. So autophagy is um, an incredibly important biological cellular process. Most cardiologists don't know about it. Uh, it is not apoptosis, not apoptosis. It is autophagy is a beneficial mm -hmm. housekeeping process. Apoptosis is a form of cell death. So let's separate the two. So autophagy is uh, what you need 
in order to clean house. If uh, cardiomyocytes have accumulated debris, uh, dysfunctional organelles like mitochondria, they have to get rid of them. Well, they get rid of them by encircling them uh, with a, a double membrane mm -hmm. and then lysing them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the process of autophagy. It's originally uh, was developed uh, evolutionarily as a starvation response mm -hmm. because it would generate ATP. But in uh, a states of nutrient surplus, uh, then autophagy is a cytoprotective mechanism, gets rid of oxidative stress, inflammatory pathways. And I thought, well, this is so important to cardiomyocyte health that we should develop drugs that promote autophagy, and that that should be the next generation of the treatment of heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. How far are we with that? Well, it seems like we actually are there because SGLT2 inhibitors actually create a state of starvation mimicry, and they promote autophagy, dramatically so. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they do so not only in uh, in uh, whole organisms, not only in isolated hearts, but in isolated cardiomyocytes that do not express SGLT2. So it's a direct effect to promote autophagy. And what, here's what's so amazing. If you um, genetically or pharmacologically block autophagy, you completely block the benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors. So we actually know really autophagy, it's a proof of concept. It's interfering with the physiological process, using it to uh, be an, a treatment target as well. Exactly, and, it, and now we actually have drugs that do that. Well, we've now spoken twice about SGLT2 inhibition, which is really a proof as well that this class has been uh, a great change in the way we manage our patients and plus they are preventive as well of the development of heart failure. And now go, moving on to the third prediction, this is about drug development and we've been speaking about drug development and you predicted that uh, drug development in the field of heart failure, imagine this, would actually be ceasing if certain things wouldn't happen. Yes, um, I may, but the, uh, the prediction was a dire one. Uh, quite, quite dire. Uh, the prediction was that uh, because of pricing pressures, uh, that uh, patient, the drug development for heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction would cease. And the reason is that we would develop so many drugs that would be effective and they would all be used together and that implementation would not happen uh, because it would be too expensive. And as a result, uh, most patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction wouldn't get these drugs and there would be no purpose served for developing new ones. And so we thought, well, you know, innovation would move towards heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction or would move to devices or to other things. But that drug development for heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction would subside. And Carlos, it seems like it's subsiding. I agree with you. Uh, would implementation science be a helper in this field because slow uptake of the drugs will be one of the reasons why prices are kept high. Oh, what a wonderful question. Um, I, uh, I wish we knew how to improve to implementation. Improve implementation. Um, I am not certain that if we improved implementation that prices would fall. Well, that's a dire as well. Let's move to prediction number four. <laughs> well, prediction number four is also a conceptual one. It's about yeah. the care of heart failure and the very unlikely uh, possibility that cardiologists by themselves will be able to handle all patients with heart failure. And the need that we also need to face that uh, we need, you know, we need to be aware of how much heart failure incidence, prevalence, and mortality 
have been increasing contrary to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which are on a right way, you know. This is a huge problem. Are we cardiologists really going to be able to take care of all patients? Well, we don't do that now. Who should we involve? We cardiologists take care of a tiny fraction of patients with heart failure. Most patients with heart failure are taken care of in primary care settings. Uh, 80% in the United States, it's about 80% uh, in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, the you know, cardiologists are, are very, very focused on things that they can do uniquely specialized procedures, specialized diagnostic tests, uh, writing prescriptions for heart failure. Mm -hmm. uh, cardiologists think that maybe someone else should do that. It's not that they do a, um, a, 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 an awful job. It's, it's just that most people with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction are not getting prescribed drugs. Uh, and that's uh, particularly true in primary care. It's, a, it's better in cardiology. But I have always thought that what we should do, do is develop a non-physician-based task force to conquer heart failure. And, and we can do that uh, without involving physicians. We can drive that at a non-physician level. I think it would have a dramatic impact on public health and an uptake in implementation science. We could actually do this, mm. but we, um, the only way that uh, we can do this is to incentivize non-physicians and train non-physicians to do this appropriately. Would you agree that this is something that holds has to be done at a more local level because yeah. there are regional, local issues? Uh, sometimes it may not be possible to have nurse practitioners prescribing medicines or changing uh, medications. But at a national level, I do see, for example, in my country, efforts to structure the care into different levels for patients with uh, heart failure and to have them you know, move around easily and have more people involved than just the only cardiologist. But at least your prediction has served as a basis to incentivate people to organize within their local uh, realities the care of these patients. Every community has its own challenges. They know how to solve their problem. They can organize it in a variety of ways. They can say 70% of patients with heart failure can be taken care of by uh, uh, nurses, uh, physician assistants, they don't have to be physicians. When something special is necessary, something extraordinary is special, when uh, the patient progresses, when then the physician then can become yeah. more fully engaged. Absolutely. Yeah. Now prediction number five is a very interesting one. Uh, it's one that goes a little bit towards my heart because I'm uh, more interested in advanced heart failure and the alternative treatments when you get that far down the road. And this is about gene and cell-based therapy. You predicted that it would fail, but that there would be advances, on the other hand, in uh, mechanical circulatory support and other devices to help patients live longer with heart failure. You even spoke about cardiac immortality. So uh, the prediction was uh, twofold. First, that uh, cell ther therapy and gene therapy would fail. And, um, you know, so far they have not succeeded. Uh, we'll right. see what happens in the next five years. Uh, maybe that prediction will be wrong. But so far, they have not succeeded. Fair to say. Uh, the second prediction was that devices would be so enormously successful that if you could afford a device, you would not die of heart failure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, key phrase here is if you could afford the device. Well, uh, you know, if resources are limited and devices are expensive and the and it's not just doing the device, it's caring for the patient after uh, the device. Well, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a solution for a global e epidemic of, of heart failure. It may actually create deeper disparities 
in the care of patients. It will absolutely create enormous disparities in, in the care of patients. But the end of the prediction was that no one who is rich enough would ever die of heart failure. Well, it's been great to review the current status of these five predictions. I very much look forward to an opportunity <laughs> where we'll be invited to reflect on these do you have any other predictions, and a sixth prediction maybe, you would like to add, or you're okay with the ones that we've got so far? I, I'm going to stay exactly with the five that I have. So far, um, after five years, it's not, it's, it's looking pretty good. Yeah. Um, Why change the team? It's winning. I, 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 I will stay with the five, and let's look for another five Thank years. You. Thank you so much, Professor Becker. It's been a great honor to have you here with us at ESC TV Conversations in Barcelona. Thank you so much. Carlos, it's been a delight. Thank you. Thank you.